I do think we're, we're, we're seeing a lot more people, a lot more traders, investors, hedge funds, and institutions now coming into the market and, and going long. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And on a very exciting day in the precious metals markets, really excited to have Steve St. Angelo of SRS Rocco join me to dig into the wild things that are happening. We'll talk some fundamentals. Steve has also been getting into the technicals a bit more, which so have I and have been finding interesting, as well as the energy component. So with that said, Steve, great to have you on here today. How are you doing? Chris, I'm doing great, and we couldn't have picked a better day as we were talking about in a pre-interview. Yeah, we've, we've it's been seven, or f almost seven, but it's been five plus long years since we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel where gold now is back above 1,500. Uh, so it's uh, there's plenty to talk about. Yeah, and especially in silver, up 74 cents now. Geez, wow. like when, when, when's the last time we saw silver up 75 cents in a day? That's probably uh, maybe 2016 uh, or might, might even be farther back than that. No, you're you're right. Uh, and and uh, if you look at the SLV chart, I'm going to put out a, a video this weekend. Uh, if you look at the SLV chart and see the look at the volume, the volume was over 400 to uh, over 400 million uh, shares traded. Uh, in July, that's when silver took off. It's it's over 11 million now, and we're only on the the seventh uh, first week of trading. So in 2016, when silver was shooting up, you know, to 21 dollars, during those months, it the highest was 300 million uh, shares traded. So we're we're seeing, and the price didn't move as much last month. It only moved up about a dollar. But we're seeing a lot more interest now in silver. So I agree with you. And I, I think I think we're, we're getting ready to see uh, – we could see a correction, of course. Nothing goes up in a straight line. But we, as I mentioned in my article, that, that, that breakout of the, of the uh, triangle, symmetrical triangle, and now it's broke out above two moving averages. I think we could be in a new bull market, but that's not official yet. We have to, we have to wait and see uh, – maybe in the next week or so, but it, it looks like we're seeing a green light. Yeah, and Steve, I appreciate you mentioned that because you had that article and a video showing how from a technical standpoint, things were converging and we didn't necessarily know whether that means it's likely to break out up or downwards, yet that it seemed like it was likely to move one way or another especially interesting because the banks have been pretty short, both gold and silver. So in past years, this is typically where we see, you know, one of those midnight spikes and you wake up and silver is a dollar or two lower. Um, yet we haven't seen that. Combine that with, uh, you know, somewhere between 60 million hundred ounces going into the ETF. So it could be that maybe there's finally a bid that's big enough to overwhelm the offers. But if you could talk about that, maybe how you saw that happening technically, and then looking at those two factors and where that leaves us. Yeah, Chris, uh, my work since I started the website in 2013 has focused on the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are the underlying drivers of price. That they are. However, the technical analysis, and I, I didn't spend any time. I actually, I uh, I made a joke about technical analysis, and but that was unfortunately. I, I wish I had paid more attention to it sooner, because when you look at the 40-year chart of gold and silver, and I've shown this on my uh, website and, and in the videos, you can see that when silver and gold hit certain levels key resistance levels once they broke above that they they just take off mm -hmm. and so what this is what happens when the fundamentals start improving when something or an asset or a commodity or a stock hits a certain level and it jumps above it then you get like the the whole market is interested and they all jump aboard and so that's when you have these big breakouts. And so when silver, uh, the reason silver was in this, they, they call it symmetrical. And so it was 
coiling. It was getting smaller and smaller, so it was getting tight. I knew it was going to break above or below. But because gold was in that ascending triangle, and that's normally pretty bullish, when it broke above it, it went up $80 in a short period of time. And that happened in June. So my intuition told me that silver was probably likely going to break above that symmetrical triangle, which it did. And so now we're starting to see the same thing. And let me conclude by saying, even though it broke above the 50-day, 50 uh, 50-month 50 moving average, it did not, it, in, the, in the silver price, it did not break above the SLV 50-month moving average. It broke above that today. Mm -hmm. So when it broke above that today, we're seeing, what, what did you say? The silver price is now up 74 cents. So uh, I do think we're, we're, we're seeing a lot more people, a lot more traders, investors, hedge funds, and institutions now coming into the market and, and going long. Which makes sense because another thing that's been interesting is that after not hearing about silver and gold for years, unless it was Warren Buffett or someone else telling us how useless it was, I mean, all of a sudden now it seems if the media coverage has shifted quickly where we hear about Ray Dalio buying gold, yet that's been going on for over a year and a half or so, um, and certainly you know, you're starting to see some of that flow into silver. Um, and there are a lot of reasons, as you said, certainly the fundamentals to support um, higher prices in both. Now it seems like the central banks, um, you commented before we uh, started recording today that we had some more interest rate cuts around the globe and QE, not just, uh, well, I guess hasn't heated up in the U.S. just yet, although interesting to think about how far off that could be. But a lot of the other banks are also printing a lot of money right now. Yeah, I know we saw what the Chinese government and they're trying to uh, prop up the Chinese yuan that's continuing to fall. And, you know, our Federal Reserve says it's it's Chinese currency manipulation, but everybody's manipulating the, their currencies. It's And how can the Fed say that when they have the monopoly on the world's printing press? So when when China started to have trouble in its uh, currency overnight, then the other Asian markets like New Zealand, New Zealand was supposed to cut 25 basis points. They cut 50. Uh, India cut 35 basis points. So now we're starting to see more, I would say, uh, volatility in the currency markets. And this is probably part of the reason where we're seeing uh, the precious metals uh, surge the way they are today. And so if 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 these interest rates continue to fall, we're I think we're going to see more volatility and stronger precious metal prices going forward. Yeah, and that was the other thing uh, I was interested to dig into. I know you talk a lot about the connection between energy and the metals prices, and perhaps you could dig into that a bit. Yeah, Chris, the, there's two things going on in the world. Uh, there is the, uh, let's say, the, the, the economy and the, the markets. And so what we see is we see a lot of economic data, we, we, unemployment, we see the interest rates, the debt, uh, how much money printing is going on. Uh, and so we, we look at all these indicators, the stock prices. That's one aspect. Then we have the other aspect, even the precious metal prices, too. Um, and GDP growth. Now, on the other side is the is energy, because you and I, we if, if we if we can't put gasoline in a car, we can't drive to work. Or if the manufacturing company doesn't have electricity, they can't manufacture their 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 products. Unfortunately, we have totally uh, taken for granted energy. So if you if you have to understand what's happening with energy to understand what's going to happen to asset prices moving forward. And we're seeing, I've been warning about the uh, the Ponzi scheme, which I call the shale industry. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's, it's one of the, it's the biggest Ponzi scheme, I think, going forward. And we're, we're starting to see the results. Uh, Whiting Petroleum had a 38% a one day crash in its stock price when it released earnings last week. Uh, Oasis is down over 30% today. 
it, so we're starting to see the carnage now taking place in the shale industry. And why is that important? Uh, GDP growth, whether it's manipulated or not, is based upon global oil production growth. You can't have GDP growth, whether it's it's inflated or not, without global oil production growth. And if you look over the last 10 years since the last crisis in 2008, the U.S. has accounted for almost 80 percent of overall global oil production growth. So if it wasn't for the shale industry, we the Fed and central banks could not have propped up the markets with zero interest rates and money printing. That, that wouldn't have worked. It would have looked more like what's taking place in Venezuela. So I do believe a lot of the analysts are overlooking this important energy dynamic. And so, uh, again, I've been reading a little bit since you mentioned that last week. I see there's some lawsuits going around about whether they've been accurately representing what they have. What is going on with some of these companies? You mentioned it's a bit Enron-ish. Um, aside from just the actual production, is there also something else going on here of fraudulent nature? Yeah, I, I, I think we're, I think there is a, a setup for another Enron, much bigger Enron type of event to take place in the shale oil industry. And unfortunately, I can't get into that. Um, but once that comes to the public knowledge, it's going to be the final nail in the coffin. But regardless of that, um, there's the uh, the ex or let's say the former attorney general of Louisiana, I believe it's Foti. He is uh, his law firm is investigating Oasis and Whiting Petroleum. And interestingly, Oasis and Whiting Petroleum, their stock prices are down 50 percent in the last week since uh, the beginning of the month. And the, what they're alleging, and it's it's an investigation, it's not quite a lawsuit yet, but it's under investigation from the investors, is that did Oasis and Whiting's uh, management officers, did they fail to tell shareholders of the, of the implications of the rapid decline rate that is endemic in the shale oil industry? And most energy companies, shale companies, have not. Uh, warned their investors of the rapid decline rate and what that does. So this is the issue. The rapid decline rate, you can never really make money with that kind of a system. We, yes, we've brought on a lot of oil production, but really no one's made any money doing it. And so you have to throw out a lot more capital expenditures just now to maintain production. And it's becoming increasingly difficult. So going forward, what we're seeing in this last week, the carnage, even Concho Resources is down 34% in the last week. And so I think when this shale industry starts to fall apart, it's going to impact the global economy. Why? Because 80% of global oil production growth has come from the shale oil industry. That's a major, that's a very negative indicator or implication for the global and U.S. economy going forward. Yeah, and how do you see it playing out with these companies? It, it sounds like there's another shoe to drop at some point. Um, curious how you see it unfolding or and if there's any key dates for folks to watch out for coming up. Well, uh, these fields like the uh, Eagle Ford have already peaked. The back end is probably getting close to the Permium is the last one. Uh, but I think the issue is going forward. The oil price was down almost $3 today. I think it's recovered a little bit. But these companies can't make money at this price. And so what, what is their break even? Well, you know, that's the issue. There is no break even. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because when oil prices go up to $100, it raises the costs of everything. Pipe goes up, drilling fees go up, rental, everything goes up. Because, you know, when the oil price goes up, everything costs more. Because oil is the underlying driver for the price of the entire economy. And that's why we had huge inflation of the prices of the precious metals in the 1970s. Oil was $1.80 a barrel in 1970. It went to $37 in 1980. Mm -hmm. You can't have rising oil prices without rising inflation. And so 
this is the issue. Even if you get $100 oil, maybe for the first quarter or two or maybe a year, they may make a little bit of money, but then everything catches up. The prices of pipe goes up, the prices to ship uh, all the sand and fracking fluid to to uh, to make the well or to uh, complete the well, all that goes up. And so th there really isn't a break-even price. As the oil price goes higher, the break-even price goes higher. But I, I don't think we're going to see higher oil prices. Sounds, because, sounds like they've locked in a risk-free loss, as we used to say on the TV. Yes, I, I, I th that's the issue. And then if you think that the markets are going to start rolling over where the indicators, the economic indicators, are showing a weaker economy globally, then the demand for oil is going to fall. Oil prices are going to fall even further. So it's going to gut the system. And I think the small to medium-sized shale companies are going to really start to go first. But the idea that the big majors like Exxon, ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Conoco are going to take over these companies and, 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 and do a better job, they're not. They're not doing a better job. And so here's the issue. Why would Warren Buffett if he could buy a company on 10 cents a dollar, you think, well, they buy them on 10 cents a dollar. They're going bankrupt. Why would he buy a company that's losing money on 10 cents a dollar? Yeah. So that that's the issue. You don't buy a shale company, even though you can get it for pennies on the dollar, if it's losing money and it will continue to lose money. No one's going to pick these, these uh, shale companies up. Well, actually, I'll maybe uh, toss a curveball in there. There's one entity that might, may end up taking the shale companies up, and that brings us to the Federal Reserve. I'm partly joking, although who knows if five years from now they'll own the shares of basically everything um, if they run out of bonds to buy. So we had them cut a quarter point last week. What seems to have gotten less attention was that they ended the quantitative tightening uh, about two months early. And so it's interesting to see you have more trade war, one getting devalued, um, stock market sinking just in the couple days since then. Um, curious, what do you see the Fed doing in response now? Well, uh, if you, and this is where my energy analysis goes a step further, it's the thermodynamics. And the energy going, the energy content that makes it to the market continues to fall. So if it continues to fall, the, the profits in the overall system become smaller and smaller. And it gets to a point where the oil industry really can't produce the oil at a net energy uh, impact to the market. So I believe the only way forward are lower interest rates. That's the only way forward because, you see, you can't provide a high interest rate of 5 or 8%. Now, in some economies, in some markets, you see that. But at a bank, you, you, the only way you can provide a high interest rate is if you have a profit, right? You just can't give out 5 or 8% interest uh, if you're not making that 5 or 8% or more to pay the person who's got that deposit or a bondholder. So you have to have the profit of the energy in the system to pay the profits in interest. If those profits are falling due to the thermodynamics of oil depletion, so is the interest rates. They have to fall. So I look going forward, interest rates are going to continue to fall. And if the, once the Fed loses control and they do go higher, then the whole market falls apart because the economy can't afford higher interest rates. Because we, because you know why, Chris, we don't have the profitable energy to do it. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. I think there's a reason that you saw the markets get pummeled last year when rates got as high as two and a half percent. Interesting to see the same thing happening now, even as they're cutting rates. And uh, of course, Donald Trump not left out today. He was yakking on the Fed again. <laughs> They're too proud to admit their mistake of acting too fast and tightening too much. They must cut rates bigger and faster, stop their ridiculous quantitative tightening now. Um, again, far cry from it's a big fat bubble, audit the Fed gold standard while he was campaigning yet. 
seems like everybody in Washington <laughs> wants lower interest rates. And I would imagine it's got to be pretty likely we'll see that in September. I wonder when we'll start seeing quantitative easing again. I'm guessing it's not far off. Um, and in either case, Steve, it's been great catching up and digging into these things today. A lot of fascinating information you shared and will be fun to follow. So perhaps in closing, you could just let folks know where to find you, how they can read your research. Yeah, thanks, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I run the srsrockerreport.com website. I put out two or three articles uh, a, a week now, and I try to focus on the energy. I didn't before. I used to just focus on the precious metals, but the energy is, is now the most important. If you understand energy, you'll understand what's going to happen with asset prices in the future. If you don't and you become ignorant of that, it, it's going to shock a lot of people. So I also have a YouTube channel, the SRS Rock Report YouTube channel, where I put out, I try to put out a couple of videos every every couple of weeks or a month. And I'm going to do another one this weekend on the, the silver price action. So maybe, you know, in a few months we can do an update because I think we're going to see some serious fireworks some fireworks going forward uh, in the markets and the metals in the next six months, six to 12 months. Yeah, it certainly seems like the conditions are in place. I'm this is the most excited about silver I've been in quite a while. Uh, you know, obviously that it's up, but also seeing forces pressuring the markets. And I'll post that uh, video that you did, the one I watched last week, where you showed the triangle and some of the technical factors. Uh, I've watched it a couple of times and think that would be useful for folks to see. And yes, we will absolutely catch up and do this again soon. Pleasure to finally get in touch with you, Steve. And thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Chris.